I would like to welcome uh, our speaker, uh, Professor Claire Tomlin and uh, CSL members to the uh, Artichen lecture series. Uh, this is a uh, first lecture after many months of COVID and um, um, we are very happy to have even virtually uh, this um, Artichen lecture um, uh, happening. So uh, before we I introduce our speaker, I would like to give you a little bit um, background, uh, particularly to some of the newer members uh, of uh, CSL, with the history of the Artichen um, lecture. So the Artichen um, uh, Distinguished Lecture Series has been um, bringing eminent researchers from all over the world to speak at CSL since 1979. Uh, it is just one of the lasting legacies of the former CSL director, uh, Professor Robert T. Chen, who started the lecture series. Robert T. Chen was CSL director from 1973 to 1983, uh, a time when the laboratory emerged as a leader uh, in semiconductor materials and devices. During this period, CSL became one of the first university laboratories to begin research in molecular beam epitaxial and metal organic chemical vapor deposition. It's about valuable new processes for growing semiconductor crystals. Professor Chen also showed long range vision in his research with Franco Preparata and Gernot Metze, he published a seminal paper on systems level diagnosis, the rules by which one machine can diagnose another. Their model known as uh, the PMC model had a major influence on the development of fault tolerant computing. After Professor Chen's death in 1983, the CSL Distinguished Lecture Series was named the Robert T. Chen Distinguished Lecture Series in his honor. So um, in this spirit of the Robert T. Chen Distinguished Lecture Series, it is my great pleasure to welcome Professor Claire Tomlin. She's our Spring 2021 Chen Lecturer Claire is a professor of electrical engineering and computer science at the University of California at Berkeley, where she holds the Charles A. Desert Chair in Engineering. She received her bachelor degree in electrical engineering from the University of Waterloo in 1992, a master degree in electrical engineering from Imperial College London in 1993 and her PhD in Electrical Engineering and Computer Science Department from Berkeley in 1998. She had the positions of Assistant, Associate, and Full Professor at Stanford from 1998 to 2007. And in 2005, she joined the University of California, Berkeley. Claire works uh, in hybrid systems and control and integrates machine learning methods with control theoretical methods in the field of safe learning. She works in the applications of air traffic and unmanned air vehicle systems. Claire is a MacArthur Foundation Fellow, an IEEE Fellow, and an AIMBE Fellow. She was awarded the Donald P. Ekman Award of the American Automatic Control Council in 2003, an honorary doctorate from KTH in 2016. And in 2017, she won the IEEE Transportation Technologies Award. In 2019, she was elected to the National Academy of Engineering and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Please, Welcome, Professor Claire Tomlin, 
She will give her presentation on safe learning in robotics. Please, Claire. Thank you, Clara. And uh, thank you to Clara and to CSL for inviting me to give uh, this lecture. It's an honor and a pleasure to give this lecture um, named for Professor Robert T. Chen. I'm going to talk about uh, safe learning. And this is a topic that integrates work that my group and I have been um, doing since I started as an assistant professor. And um, the, the topic focuses on safety-based control and, um, and how one designs controllers to make certain guarantees about the safe behavior of a system, um, but then uh, moves into how one might use these um, recent tools of machine learning to enhance these methodologies, but still focus on safety. So this is an old slide. Um, I think I might have used a slide like this back in um, the last time I visited, which was a while ago, uh, at the University of Illinois. Um, but it's a project that's motivated me from the time I was a graduate, a graduate student, which is that of um, a very complex control system. Um, at the time that I started my PhD, NASA, and, and this continues, NASA and the FAA were very interested in understanding how one might automate some of what air traffic controllers do manually. And um, on the left, I've just shown um, actual playback of a few hours of data of traffic coming into and out of the sectors of airspace around um, the San Francisco and Oakland airports. And the snapshot just shows a snapshot of aircraft over the United States. So as controllers guide aircraft from over their sectors of airspace, the key goal um, in getting the aircraft from its entry point of the sector or to its exit point in the sector is making sure the aircraft stays separated. So all pairs of aircraft must stay um, uh, separated by five nautical miles laterally and a thousand foot uh, separation vertically. And, and that's key, it's a safety critical system. So when we're thinking about um, designing uh, some automating some of that functionality. One key uh, project that we've been working on is that of uh, separation assurance, making sure that whatever the vehicles do, there's this maintenance of uh, separation around each of the vehicles. So that's, a, that's an older slide. Um, something that's more recent is um, the integration of advanced sensors into control loops. And one of the projects that my students and I, or one sort of class of integration of sensors that my students and I have been working on is that of perception. Um, perception in particular with cameras, um, perceiving the environment, a, a vehicle perceiving the environment around it, and then automatically making decisions based on that, um, the, based on the, the, the data that's collected. Um, Skydio and Neuro are both Bay Area companies that are designing vehicles. Skydio is an air vehicle and Neuro, it's a, it's a small delivery vehicle. So it's not, uh, there's no people inside of it. It's a vehicle that is um, meant to deliver packages and food and things like that. Um, both rely heavily on cameras as one of the sensors available to them. And um, in fact, the Skydio is, it's basically like a, it has several cameras. It's, um, it's popular with um, people doing sports, having a vehicle that follows them around and records um, their, their actions and movements as they're doing maybe high performance sports. Um, but both both vehicles are autonomous or have some uh, strong autonomy functions that's based on a perception module. Okay, so, so these are kind of going from the old days to where we are today. Um, and I'm going to uh, talk today um, about a tool or maybe a, a, a suite of tools that we've been developing in my group to design safety-based controllers while um, integrating machine learning. And um, we'll start out with integrating machine learning into the safety-based control. And then we'll move near the end of the talk to this idea of um, 
learning in unstructured environments. So again, sort of perception sensors that allow an autonomous vehicle to perceive the world and um, hopefully react accordingly and in a safe way. Okay, so the first part of the talk will focus on a tool. This is a tool we've been developing um, since uh, I started, as I said, uh, reachable sets for hybrid systems. And we'll focus um, on some results there. The, the, the kind of hard part of this is the computation, how you compute these reachable sets and the corresponding safety-based control. And I'll, I'll, I'll talk about some newer work we're doing in that area. And in the second part of the talk, we'll uh, focus on this data-driven component. How do we use data that's collected in real time, in particular data from sensors, um, and incorporate that into the safety loop? Okay, so um, this, the core idea behind reachability is to compute um, a reachable set. It could be a backwards reachable set or a forwards reachable set. What I've, I've shown here conceptually is a backwards reachable set. And the idea is quite intuitive. Suppose that you have a system um, and it, uh, here I've, I've written my system as a differential equation, but it really could be any dynamic model. Um, the work that we've focused on has been for differential equations and for hybrid systems that are like systems that switch between different differential equations. And that differential equation has control actions, a vector u and disturbance actions. So things that you can control and things that happen that you can't control, disturbances in the system. State vector is x, and typically x is, um, you know, in our, in our air traffic control example, if you're thinking about a group of aircraft, you'd want that state vector x to include the states of all the aircraft that you're interested in. So for multi-vehicle systems, that problem gets, you know, quite big, the state vector. So given, given that model, um, suppose that you could characterize safety as a subset of the system state space. In fact, this red set here, let's suppose is an unsafe set. You don't want the system to get into that region. A backwards reachable set represents all those states X um, for a particular time T at which um, despite the best possible control action, the dynamics of the system that under the disturbances could drive the system into this unsafe region. So we call that um, G at time zero and we're computing backwards in time. So we can think of T as kind of a negative number going backwards in time. And so that set represents the set of states which could get into G at time zero, this unsafe set, despite the best possible control action that you can apply. Uh, because of this idea of, of uh, kind of control versus disturbance, we use a game theory as the underlying framework for computing or for characterizing and then computing reachable sets. Um, namely, we're pitting the disturbance against the control in a way to think about we want to protect against the worst case disturbance, which at first sight sounds quite conservative, although it doesn't have to be, as we'll see in, in the computations that we show. Um, we showed in earlier work, and um, this was done, um, you know, we, we worked on it, um, although there was a, there's a history of um, computations in, in computing reachable sets. Um, uh, Bert Sekas uh, did some early work with uh, Ian Rhodes in computing reachable sets for discrete systems. Uh, we worked with Shankar and John Ligeros on this. Um, the work that I'm presenting here is with my first PhD student, or two of my first PhD students, Ian Mitchell and Alex Bayan. And there's been a lot of other work, much, a lot of it I'm not presenting here, but, you know, following on um, working in time varying formulations, um, in, um, in uh, time varying formulations with constraints, obstacles, etc. Um, the idea is that that reachable set, that backwards reachable set, which we're calling G at time T, so that set at time T can be posed, or can be represented as the sub-zero level sets of a function J where that function J solves a particular Hamilton-Jacobi-Isaacs equation. 
This is um, an equation where J, the left hand, it's a partial differential equation. The left hand side describes how J is evolving as a function of T. And on the right hand side, you have how J is evolving as a function of the state X. Um, you know, and that's, um, you take the inner product between that and the dynamics itself. So that's the Hamiltonian of the problem. The, the max over control of, of the min over D has that kind of um, game action. So the control is trying to do its best to keep the function positive outside that unsafe region. While the disturbance, we don't know what it's gonna do. So we're going to assume it's doing its best to try to push the system inside that unsafe region. And so we actually solve that PDE using grid-based methods, which start at the boundary of the computation, uh, the boundary of the initial data you have. So that, that set that you've characterized as safe and they work backwards in time. So they compute the solution iteratively, always forming as you're solving J of XT, you're always capturing the sub-zero level sets of that function as the backwards reachable set. Okay, so there's, there's a neat advantage here that we're defining sets implicitly through this function in one higher dimension, J of XT. And as a result, if we can compute J of XT, we can characterize that set. It doesn't have to be convex. It doesn't even have to be connected. There could be disconnected parts of that set, but we can capture it through this, the sub-zero level sets of that function. Um, and this just is a slide which shows that a little more stylistically. If we take a slice of that function in higher dimension and we kind of look at where the set comes from, the initial data, which is that initial red ellipse is captured through our initial, that initial curve, J of XT. And then the hamilton jacobi isaacs function um, PDE is evolving that function over time. So we're capturing always the sub-zero level sets of that function to be able to capture that set. Um, a couple of things we'll see later. So invariance. If that set closes off, if for a particular time the set stops growing, the dynamics are such that it just doesn't get any bigger, uh, which can happen. Um, so we call that controlled invariant. After that point in time, the set doesn't change. Then any super zero level set of that function is also invariant. Kind of meaning if you can stay outside of a super zero level set, then you stay outside of the zero level set. And so you can also use those super zero level sets for safety. And then the more you know about the model, in particular, the unknown aspects of the model, which here are, in the, our case, are the disturbances, um, then um, the, more, like the more you know about how the disturbance behaves, the better, the, the better characterized are the dynamics and, um, and you can um, be less conservative. So this, the set that you want to then avoid becomes smaller. So it really, it's a tool that allows you if, you, if you can characterize your specification like safety as a subset of the state space of the system, then, and if you can compute the solution to this PDE, then you've solved for this interesting construct, which is this, this reach, backwards reachable set. And then the implications of this are that you have this, you have this set, and then any control law that you'd like to apply, you've got, you know, you can operate here in the safe region, you know that you're safe for however long you've computed that set for. So suppose this was controlled invariant, then as long as you can stay in the blue region, you're safe for all time. The Hamilton Jacobi calculation also gives you the best control to use. So when you, um, you're applying that control law and you hit the boundary, and I'm just trying to get my, yeah, good. And you hit the bound, so you're applying the control law, you hit the boundary, you have at your, at, from that computation, the control law to use to stay out of the set. You apply that max U control law. And depending on where you are, you've got that computation. Um, you, um, you can also, so it's, it's like you've, you've taken that problem of safety and you've characterized it as a kind of filter. As long as you're away from the boundary, you can apply any control you want. When you hit the boundary, if you apply the control for safety, you'll stay outside of that unsafe, that computed unsafe set. Okay, so we, um, uh, Ian Mitchell, as I said, he was one of my first PhD students, and um, he built a toolbox. He calls it Toolbox LS for it's a level set toolbox. 
So we, we were inspired by the level set methods of Stan Osher and Jamie Sethian. And, um, and they'd been working a lot on computing level set methods for solving PDEs in general, fluid flow problems. So we took those and applied them to the Hamilton Jacoby Isaacs formulation. And then Ian built this toolbox, which is downloadable from his site. He's now the chairman of computer science at, at University of British Columbia in Vancouver. Um, and you can see sort of from this example, this is again, one of our older examples, there's some nice things here for control. So what we're doing when we solve this PDE using level set methods, this Hamilton Jacoby Isaacs PDE, is we're creating this level set function, J of X T. The boundary of the region is defined implicitly by the zero level set of that function. The, um, the magnitude, if we use a sine distance function, which is often the uh, way we encode the initial data, then the magnitude of J at any X T is the distance to the boundary, which is also useful for control. And um, that function is negative inside the region and positive outside. So this is for this funny shaped function, this is what it looks like. Since, um, since Ian coded this, um, my group has been working on methods to, you know, just computational methods for speeding this up. And we have on our um, reachability GitHub site, a tool which we call vehicles. It's uh, the B is for Berkeley, but it's a, it's a, uh, we, we've taken the level set toolbox and we kind of built a wrapper that, um, uh, and, and we've encoded several of the level set functions in C++ and we parallelized it. So there's a, a kind of more modern version to use, which is faster and employs parallelization. And both of those links are there. And both of them have, um, well, Ian's definitely and ours okay, uh, good documentation for you know, how to use it. You can download examples, pull out their dynamics, put in your dynamics and use it for, um, and use it as a toolbox fairly easily. Okay, um, example one, again, old example from when I was at Stanford. These are four of our quad rotors. We built these ourselves. So this was a while ago when it was hard to buy quad rotors. Um, each quad rotor is being flown by a PhD student and the students are trying to collide the quad rotors with each other. On the right is a snapshot at a particular point in time showing each quad rotor with the backwards reachable set um, with uh, respect to each of the other three quad rotors around it. So when one, so the experiment then is the students are joysticking the quad rotors around when one of the quad rotors gets to the boundary of the reachable set with respect to another quad rotor, then the quad rotor at the origin starts to take the evasive action, that max over U that comes out of the Hamilton Jacoby calculation to push it away from, to, to get that vehicle off its boundary and to make sure it stay, it goes back into the safe region of operation. So now, as long as the vehicle doesn't enter these regions and we have the control laws to guarantee that they don't, then you can guarantee that this, um, this entire system stays safe. And this example with these four quad rotors is one of the unique, or not unique, but there's a few examples where the dynamics are such that you can decouple that four vehicle system into these pairs of vehicles and look at pairwise safety to guarantee safety as a group. Now, I, um, I'm happy to take questions. I'm happy to be interrupted if you have a question while I'm talking. Um, I can't see the chat very well. So while I'm talking, the best thing to do is to just unmute yourself and say, excuse me, I have a question or just yell out. Um, and I'm, not, I'm going to, there'll also be some time at the end for questions. So Claire, since you said we can ask questions. So in the previous yes. example, uh, your original results were for a single controller, right? I mean, if, if there are multiple quadrators, each one taking evasive action, what happens? I mean, how does the- uh, Yeah, so in this example, because the, um, because the vehicles can hover, so a safe action for those vehicles is that they can hover, then you can separate the, even though you know, each pair of vehicles, each vehicle can be um, you know, a kind of pursuer and evader in that game format. So we're looking at, we're looking at all pairs in that group of four and we're, um, we're computing pairwise collision sets with each other. Um, 
But because the, the vehicles can hover, then that decomposition of the um, safety problem into these uh, separate pairwise problems, it works. So that means that you can prove if you stay outside the union of those, those three different sets around each vehicle, then the safety is guaranteed as the group. But that's not, that's not a, that, you, that, that can't be generalized to vehicles. Okay. You have to have certain properties to make that satisfied. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, so um, so you can also use this technology of reachable sets to um, to reach desired regions. So now um, blue represents something that's desired. So you have a desired set, the backwards reachable set. We often call that the capture zone, and the computation is the same except the min and the max have traded places. So well, they haven't traded places, but the u is now a minimizer. It's trying to get into this uh, set, so it's trying to go to lower values of j where the disturbance is a maximizer. We're trying to assume that the, dis or we're assuming that the disturbance is trying to do its best to get the vehicle away from the lower values of J. And so it, the computation is the same and we can also encode this, you know, design, you want to reach a set despite the worst possible disturbance. Again, the disturbance may be something that's just, you know, a kind disturbance, but we're assuming that we don't know what it is and we want to be safe. So we're going to assume if we get on the boundary that we better play our best action to um, avoid the disturbance, you know, maybe inadvertently playing its worst action. And you can piece these uh, ideas together. So you can um, we compute this uh, set we call a reach avoid set, the set of states which is uh, guaranteed, from which you're guaranteed to get to a desired target set um, while avoiding an unsafe region. Okay, so here, you know, the, the trajectory is trying to get to this target set while avoiding this unsafe region. So it has to avoid the, um, the backwards reachable set of that set computed over the same time horizon over which you're reaching the target set. And you can sequence these. So if um, you're working with a hybrid system where you're switching between different dynamics, then um, you could, for example, chain these sets together where you compute first in the, in, the, um, in the particular dynamic that you're in, the capture, the capture set from a target set that's inside the capture basin of your ultimate target set, all the while avoiding this uh, unsafe region. And because we're using this, um, uh, the, we're defining the sets and the control, we're defining the sets implicitly and we're computing the control laws from those implicit sets, this idea of, um, of uh, a reach of void actually becomes quite intuitive mathematically. It's a, um, what's called a variational inequality. So you're, you're computing the solution to the hamilton jacobi equation subject to a constraint, which is like a mask of those sets. So this is the variational inequality. Okay, so you can do a reach of void and you can also string together these computations. Okay, so I'm going to spend a, a little bit of time talking about computation because that's one of the big, I mean, I would say that's the biggest problem here, that computing that Hamilton Jacobi equation requires gridding up the state space of the system. And if you're looking at any interesting problem, you know, that quad rotor, we had four vehicles. <clears throat> and any kind of reasonable model of a quad rotor has, you know, th at least three or four states to it. So, you know, a 16 dimensional system is beyond the limits of, of what we can do by solving a Hamilton Jacobi equation by grid, grid based methods. Um, so what do we do in general? Well, in general, we can't decompose it nicely like we did for that quad rotor, the four quad rotor example. So we look at other methods and, and there's a community of people, many of them at Illinois, working on this problem of um, reachability model checking in high dimensions. And so I've listed only some of the um, contributions from the community um, which is it's sort of at the intersection of computer-aided verification and control, people working on these problems. So you can, you know, in practice, what do we do? We impose practical constraints. The air traffic control system, there are highways in the sky. You've got, you know, the ground transport, you've got roads, highways, protocols that you have to follow. So you don't have a whole bunch of vehicles there at any given time. 
Uh, so we can employ that in our solutions, right? So impose practical constraints, which is typically what we would want to do anyway. Um, approximations. So make approximations to, for example, the kind of dynamics. If you're if you're trying to solve a Hamilton-Jacobi equation and you've got linear dynamics with a quadratic cost, then we have a closed form solution, which is the Riccati, which, via the Riccati equation. Um, so you can you can approximate your dynamics. You can approximate the sets instead of representing them implicitly through uh, level sets. You could get some savings using um, ellipsoidal or polyhedral sets um, and other methods. Um, you could look at the mathematical structure of the problem. So people have worked on monotone systems, uh, linear temporal logic specifications. Uh, you could formally decompose systems. So like, um, uh, unlike the special case that I spoke about with the four quad rotors, there do exist um, ways to take a high dimensional differential equation sometimes and decompose it into a set of lower dimensional projections, which you can then, you know, do the computation in the lower dimensions and then back project to form an over approximation of the actual unsafe region. And this is something that we've, we've also, as well as others, have worked on. I'm going to talk um, about two methods today. One is um, how might we exploit offline computation and do reachability computations in for real-time path planning in robotics. Um, this is work with uh, Sylvia Herbert, who just finished her PhD last year, Mo Chen, who's um, finished a couple of years ago, uh, David Fridovich Kyle, and Jaime Fizak. Um, and you can also use um, machine learning methods to help in the computation. And, and um, there are several folks that have worked on this. I'm gonna talk about our recent work with Samuel Bansal on this. Okay, so this is, um, I'm gonna introduce this offline method through an example um, called, uh, called the example fast and safe planning. Um, actually, when Nancy Amato was visiting Berkeley a few years ago, we spoke about this and, and, um, and she gave a lot of inspiration into thinking about how you might use these pre-computed sets in real time um, in, in, in kind of a robotic path planning scenario, which are, they're typically run in real or they're, you know, always you'd like them to be run in real time. So the, you know, this is sort of a slide which has the control side on the left and the robotic path planning side on, on, on the right. The control is, you know, safety based kind of conservative. So what are we always doing? Slow and accurate planning, right? We've got our whatever 12 dimensional quad rotor model. We're gonna use that model. We're gonna compute a control law and here are our obstacles. We're gonna design a path which is, uh, will avoid those obstacles. And because we're using such a good model we're gonna track that path pretty accurately using, you know, a good maybe nonlinear control scheme. So it's great, but it's too slow typically for the dimensions that we're looking at. On, on, the, on the other hand, on the right hand side is, you know, a robotic path planner. So don't use full dynamics, use simple dynamics, maybe even just a point mass that, or, or you come up with points and straight lines between points. Come up with a, you know, a quickly a path that avoids obstacles and then, you know, track that using a linear quadratic regulator or something like that. The challenge is that you know you're not guaranteed to stay away from the you're you're guaranteed to you know track the path, but you're going to have some error because the model that you've planned with is different from your actual dynamics model, even under a closed loop control. And so this is taken into account by typically you know bloating your point or bloating the obstacles. But how much to bloat those by is you know what we were interested in, and we thought well we could actually use reachability to do that. So the idea is to um, use the difference between a simple, um, like a point mass model or some simple low dimensional model and a high dimensional, more accurate model. So you've, you've got like the relative dynamics between those two models of the same vehicle. And you use that model to pre-compute a reachable set so that you stay within a, um, a boundary around the low dimensional model. And then you use that low dimensional model with that boundary, as long as you've got a control law computed via reachability, which will keep you inside that region, 
use that as your bloat uh, around the vehicle. So you use the fast planner, but you plan with this error bound around you that you've computed offline in a principled way using reachability. Okay, so here's an example that um, just shows you the, the, the idea. So the, what's the reachable set problem here? So we have these relative dynamics between the low dimensional model and the high dimensional model. We'll call the low dimensional the planning system and the high dimensional the tracking system. Uh, the planning system, you, know, you can imagine it's your adversary and the tracking system is trying to track it. So your control is your tracking and your planning is your disturbance and you just capture the maximum cost over time. So this is, this is a, a computation of exactly that. We've computed that reachable set. Actually, let's go to the next slide, which shows it a little more intuitively. So if we take slices of that set, so here's our, you know, this might be our initial boundary, our tracking error that we'd like to stay within, you know, maybe one meter or here, this is 0.75 meters or 0.5 meters. Um, we can um, take those slices in these dynamics and compute the backwards reachable set. So the set of states for which under those relative dynamics, you're guaranteed to stay within that tracking bound. And so this is this shows that computation as this, you know, shows the slices of computation in two dimension. These are three dimensional projections of that reachable set. Here we're using a four dimensional model. And, um, and these are two dimensional slices. So here in the 0.5 meter uh, radius around the planning model, there's no volume inside that set computed by the reachable set method. You see it just sort of winds up and disappears. That means that with the dynamics that we've specified for planning and tracking, there's no control law which will keep the tracking model within 0.5 meters of the planning model. Uh, but for a 0.75 radius, meter radius, there is actually some volume, that purple region. So what that says is the tracking model is guaranteed to stay within 0.75 meters of the planning model. It'll stay within this purple set and you have a control law that'll keep it in that purple set. And for the, um, for the one meter, you have even more radius that you can stay within. So this, this is something that's invariant to the environment you're in. You can compute this set offline in higher dimensions and then just employ it in real time. And so let's just take a look at some examples here. Okay, so we, we've used this a uh, number of examples. I think the most interesting one is a project that we worked on um, in a collaboration with Anka Dragan's group. Um, where we asked, okay, we'd like now our robot to um, fly around, but the, the, pe the obstacles that it's uh, going to avoid are people that are moving around in the environment. So we'll start with just a one, um, one vehicle, one person scenario. Our vehicle is this uh, quad rotor and a per there's a person in the environment. The model that we've used to represent the motion of the person is a model that's um, been used quite a bit in the robot motion planning community. It's, um, it's called a noisily rational human model. It's, um, if you look at this a little bit, it's a, it's a Boltzmann model where beta is a scalar parameter that represents um, like the inverse temperature coefficient in the Boltzmann model. And basically this model is capturing um, a, um, uh, a model that represent, that says that the actions of the human, so the probability of the human's action are, um, are higher depending on how efficient they are for any encoded goals you have of that person. So Q represents your, your basically your value function for your person, and that's parameterized by goals that the person may have. So in this scenario, we have a person in, in, in say, an indoor environment that's moving in a room. And, um, and we know ahead of time, we could learn these, but we know ahead of time possible goals for that person. Here there's just one and it's the door. The person wants to get out of the door. So the possible actions of the human are, you know, you can move in different directions, but this model says the, um, the probability of which action that person will take 
is higher depending on how efficient that action is to get the person towards their goal, which is the door. So this distribution, you know, for different values of beta, et cetera, would lead to this kind of path where this region of higher probability in pink and lower probability in this kind of blue-green region. Um, the parameter beta represents the spread of that distribution. So, you know, if you have a, a low, beta can, you know, be uh, zero and positive. So if beta is zero, then you could, that could model a uniform distribution over actions. Whereas beta increases in value to more positive values, it puts most of the probability mass on the action, which is optimal for the given goal. So, so for example, what you could do then is, is observe the human behavior and, um, and then you know, choose a value of beta and like predict which, where the human will be using this model over the next few time steps. What, what we did in addition to that was we said, well, if we're observing the person, we can also um, think about this parameter beta and basically update beta based on how confident we are on the model that we're imposing, this Boltzmann model with these, um, this parametric vector theta, which represents goals. I mean, they may have goals that are different than the ones we enunciated. This may not be a good model. And so what we did was we incorporated a, like a, a Bayesian update on this belief of uh, the parameter theta saying that um, our belief on beta is going to update based on the actions of the human. So if the person's moving towards the goal and all of a sudden they forget their keys and turn around, um, we become less confident. So we're going to lower the value of beta accordingly. So it's kind of the distribution starts at the next time step will spread out indicating we're becoming less confident in what the person's going to do. Okay, so it's, a, it's a, a fairly simple update on a model that's been used quite a bit for predicting uh, human pedestrian motion in um, these kind of controlled environments like indoor and labs and things. Okay, so now here's, um, here's a play out of that experiment using fast track. So fast track is our, is our fast and safe tracking algorithm that we designed for computing, um, pre-computing a reachable set for the quad rotor path planning in an environment. And now our obstacles are, um, this is Jaime and this is Sylvia. They're both moving to across our lab, which is fairly small. Um, so Jaime is moving in this direction and Sylvia is moving towards the lab door. And there are two quad rotors. So each quad rotor is allowed to observe the actions of Sylvia and Jaime, and it's updating, um, it's, uh, each is updating its model of Sylvia and Jaime based on their actions as to whether or not they're um, rational uh, or the, 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 like based on the model confidence that we have in that model. And that's sort of measuring how rational that model is um, when we understand what the goals of Sylvia and Jaime are. And so we'll play this video and you can see and so the quad rotors first go and then um, Sylvia and Jaime start to move. Jaime is moving a little irrationally. He's kind of going a little more slowly than our model predicts. He's dancing a little bit. Um, and, um, and they, in the middle of the room, they both have to pause because they, you know, they meet each other. The quad rotors aren't modeling that interaction. They're just modeling the separate representations of Sylvia and Jaime. So let's play that one more time and now focus on the top down view in the bottom right of the screen. So you see the kind of prediction, you see kind of initially as they start to move, Sylvia's observed, like she's a little more rational than Jaime is at the outset. You see this quadrotor pause. So fast track has computed, you know, it's trying to compute a path which stays away from these high probability regions of Sylvia and Jaime where they're going to be. And so it pauses until Jaime is passed. So it can confidently um, plan through that kind of tube that's created by the intersection of Sylvia and Jaime. Okay, so that was done in real time using fast track um, and then using this, uh, um, this Boltzmann model for Sylvia and Jaime. Let me spend um, just a couple of minutes talking about the second methodology for um, dealing Can I ask with a quick question on this? Hello? Yes, please. Yeah. How uh, do you, question. Uh, yeah. Do you take into account the 
the shapes of the objects, especially if they are dynamic? Uh, the shapes are changing, you know, the object shapes. Yes. So in that work, um, we're taking into account, so I'm just going to use this uh, picture that we have here. Um, this is this region around Jaime, for example, and we've compute, we've, we're just displaying, you know, so, um, what we did was we thresholded the probability distribution. So we had to, we had to choose that threshold. And then we, um, and, and so that's actually a parameter that can be changed. And then in fast track, we avoid that thresholded region. So that the shape of the obstacle is changing because, you know, as the probability distribution changes, the, um, the projection onto the 2D space changes. And what about the change shape of the moving object itself? That yeah, too? so that is the moving, that, that's, that's exactly the moving obstacle, okay. right? So here, this is the obstacle that's moving and the quad rotors are here. So they're planning, I haven't shown their, well, these right now, these pink regions. So there's, there's a little bit of overlap um, with the low probability regions, just because we set the threshold to be, that was allowable. We integrate that over the trajectory itself. So there's a threshold for the probability distribution. And then when we, um, we compute what's allowable in terms of intersection with obstacles, changing the, changing the shape of the obstacles because those probability distributions are changing. Um, there's a, a, when we integrate that over the whole trajectory, there's a, a threshold there too. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, we've been working for a number of years in, oh, are there any other questions? Okay. Um, we've been working for a number of years in grid-free based methods um, that have come out of the scientific computing community. And just to, I think I'll go through this quite quickly, but one recent uh, work that we've done is to, instead of using a grid-based method, we've trained a neural network to compute solutions to that Hamilton-Jacobi function. So the idea here is to use, we call it deep reach for a deep neural network method to compute reachable sets. But the idea is to um, take the data, so data of, of states and time, and compute a loss function where for the neural network, for training the neural network, which is um, the Hamilton-Jacobi equation. So here's the Hamilton-Jacobi equation and the initial data. So this function L of X represents that set G of zero that we started with. So the initial data of, of, of the computation. Um, and, um, and then use that loss to find a value function, which we then use to repeat with you know, sample data of the system. This is um, basically the idea for this came from a, um, well, let, let me say that in a second. But the, the idea for this came because um, the complexity of level set methods, the grid-based method that we're use, that we've been using, is um, somehow it's not scaling by the complexity of the value function, but it's really scaling by the size of the state space. And so maybe an alternative representation of this value function learned from a neural network could um, you know, get away from this, you know, somehow accurately represent the complexity and not worry too much about the state space itself. The, the idea is that we'd like the points at which you do computation to be important for the actual function that you're trying to solve. So, so one thing we did here was uh, we were inspired by some work that came out last summer in which a new type of neural network was proposed rather than this, this ReLU neural network, which is quite uh, popular. Um, you know, we recognize that you know, in computing um, in the particular loss function that we're looking at, you know, we're interested in computing gradients of functions. We're taking derivatives. So that's um, you know, not really well posed here for ReLUs. And there was this paper um, by Gordon uh, Wettstein's group at Stanford. They work in problems in computer vision where they proposed this um, method called SIREN, uh, SIREN for sinusoidal representation network, where the activation functions are sinusoids instead of ReLUs. Um, and that, um, 
uh, is a way, so, so it provides a way you can, where you can represent both the value function and the gradient with these uh, sinusoidal functions, because the derivatives of sinusoids are sinusoids. And then we can also, you know, do, do what we want to do, which is to compute the control law from the boundary of these sets. Okay, so we, we propose this method and, and um, this is new and I'm not going to spend much time on it, but um, we've been able to now solve larger problems with deep reach than we've been able to solve before directly without using some kind of de uh, decomposition, for example. So this is a three vehicle um, collision avoidance problem. There's a pursuer and two evaders. And um, the blue region here represents the set. If you, if you did what I showed before, where you decompose the problem into, you, you compute the, the two, like a pursuer evader twice, and then you take the union of those, you get this region here. Of course, this, these aircraft can't stop. They're aircraft models. They can't hover like the quad rotors. And so, so you can actually show that there are states outside of that region where, you know, if the pursuer is at that state, it will cause a collision. So here, this is the, the pink region represents the unsafe set for the pursuer, um, which is computed via deep reach. And so you can see the difference. So for example, at that purple state there, if the pursuer is right there and they apply the optimal action, which is computed via deep reach, so that's the solution to the Hamilton-Jacobi equation, you can see that there is a loss of separation. Basically the pursuer is forcing the two evaders to lose separation with each other, where the red line here represents that minimum separation. But if you go right outside that pink region, so here's a point here, if the pursuer were here, then the optimal solution for all three, it maintains separation, but just, you know, kind of like appropriate for a state on the boundary. So this is initial work. We haven't, the work that we've done has been largely empirical here, but we think that this is a um, promising method for computing solutions to Hamilton-Jacobi equations. Um, and I'm just going to skip the second example, which is a 10 dimensional two car narrow passage example, which we've also computed via a deep reach, but the paper is on archive if you're interested in taking a look at that. So is this deep reach, uh, uh, everything is computed offline, so which means that you need to know the environment that you're going to be operating in, or how does that, um, is, is everything, uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so the, the neural network is trained offline, okay. uh, but then it's applied online. So you don't need to know the environment. So here um, in the second example, there, um, there are two cars that are, you know, you have your desired conditions. Well, okay, you, you assume that you can sense the vehicle, um, say this vehicle that stopped, which provides an obstacle, but you sense it in enough time to be able to represent that in as a function, as an avoidance function in your Hamilton-Jacobi computation. Okay, and, and uh, since you're only training it for a few states and times and basically extrapolating it. That's basically what a neural network does, I guess. Then there would be some error, right, in the, in the, uh, in the computation. So, so from a robustness perspective, is there any issue but by approximating? Yeah, uh, so that's a really good question. So, you know, what we've done so far, we've, um, we've computed this, uh, this deep reach network. So, and, and we didn't do a lot of, um, optimization of the hyperparameters, right? We used a three layer neural network, um, like 512 nodes in each layer. Uh, we trained it ahead of time. For, it took like 16 hours to train this 10 dimensional uh, network. Um, and it appears that we're, uh, you know, in the, in the solutions we're getting, we're doing better than the level set methods. Oh. Um, okay, so there's a lot of work to be done in analyzing this, so it's more, you know, what we find is that we're not, when, when we, um, for example, when we trained a network, um, 
I didn't show the results here, but let me just go back to this three aircraft example. So we started out doing a bunch of two aircraft examples where we have the solution via level set methods. And we can represent those in relative coordinates as a like a three dimensional model or inertial coordinates as a six dimensional model. But mathematically, the problems are the same. So with the same amount of training, Deep Reach got exactly the same solutions for the three dimensional or the six dimensional. And so it's, it's, it's sort of results like that that we're excited about, that the, the neural network um, computation seems to care less about the dimension of the continuous state space than about the complexity of the functions themselves. And so, so there's a lot of work that needs to be done, like you said, to analyze the robustness of these solutions. Um, but we think it's a promising I think it's a promising computational method for solving some of these high-dimensional PDEs. Thanks. Hey, Saurabh. Uh, hey, Claire. Yeah, so I was uh, just a quick question that, uh, so this choice of sign activations as opposed to ReLU activations, I would have thought for estimating something like, like value functions, it would make more sense to have ReLU-like activations because, you know, they go linearly far, I mean, like they, they expand, the value increases as you go far away from the goal state or something like that, or like from a safe set. Well, it's interesting because we don't, I don't know how much of that sinusoid is like, you know, is, is being represented in the function. Like what we're ending up doing is representing that uh, value function as some function of sinusoids. Uh -huh. So it's like a function of, of, of different sinusoids and it's getting a fairly accurate representation of this value function. So, you know, I agree with a single ReLU. Yeah, you, you as you move out, you, you would maybe better represent the fact that this value function is increasing as you um, increase in space. But I think it's more appropriate to think of it as, you know, we're, we're looking at this function of sinusoids that's doing overall a better job of capturing that value function than a function of ReLUs is. Mm -hmm. and, and at heart, I think that, um, you know, the, the problem where you can't take the, the derivative of the ReLU is, is an issue. So we did in the paper that we've put on archive, we've done a comparison with a ReLU neural network as well. And you can see it really doesn't capture capture the value function very well. Okay, thanks a lot. Yeah, thanks. That's, yeah. That's really so Kildi, just, I have a question as well. Yeah. Okay, so what's the benefit of the Celio compared with, let's say, sigmoid? Using a sinusoid instead of something like a sigmoid? Yeah, like a new standard nonlinear activation function. Yeah. You know, that's another question that's interesting to take a look at. So we tried, um, we tried a, a, a hyperbolic tan. We mm. tried a couple of other functions as well, not just sinusoid. And as I said, this is experimental. So yeah, I yeah, don't yeah. know the answer to your question, yeah. but sinusoid seemed to give us the best results. <clears throat> now that's completely empirical at this point, but we have some hypotheses as to why some other nonlinear functions didn't work as well. Uh, could it be, uh, sorry, Professor, uh, could it be something related to the fact that um, you could represent the you could take the Fourier transform of the dynamics of the system and that somehow gets more better encoded by sinusoids. So that's actually a really interesting point that we've also looked into because, you know, in the signal processing literature, there's a wealth of material about sinusoids and using them as a kind of, you know, basis set for, for representing nonlinear functions in general. And so we're, we've, been, we've been looking at that and, and that's part of the comparison that we did. But I think that, as I said, there's a lot of analysis still to do. And this was, I view as a starting point, but, but maybe a starting point in this growing body of literature that's trying to use neural nets to, to do like scientific computations, like to solve these PDEs, for example. And you know, you, you're starting to see more research popping up as, as this is really, you know, think of this as a computational engine for solving some of these mathematical problems that have been a challenge so far. These are all good questions, and a lot of them I don't know the answer to right now. Yeah, I also have a question regarding like the smoothness of the value function, based on yeah. my experience. Well, so value function is usually uh, continuous, but not, not quite smooth, right? Um, yeah, it doesn't have to be, right? Especially mm, over time. Yeah. Even if you start out with continuous data, it's going to, um, in general, these Hamilton-Jacobi solutions are going to develop uh, uh, non-smooth uh, components yeah. to them. Yeah, but your new, your new network is going to be uh, a very smooth function. 
yeah. is there going to be any issue? Okay, so actually we did some analysis on that too, because in this particular, in the two vehicle case, you see one of these kind of kinks in the solution developing. And it's a smooth approximation to that kink, but it's a good approximation. So I agree there's trade-offs and maybe it's a like the how we explore what functions to use will be interesting moving forward. But still we're getting a fairly good representation with sinusoids. <coughs> yes, besides like if you learn a value function, <coughs> the control law will be computed by like the gradient of the value function, right? The control law is computed via the gradient of the value function, yeah. And when you're facing a function, are you also like, like penalizing the error in the gradient? Uh, sorry, can you repeat that question? Like, so when you're training your neural network, do you also care about like the accuracy of the gradient? Oh, very much so. And that's, uh, so we're not, only, um, we're not only looking at the function itself, but the gradient of the function. And, and you, if you take a look at the paper, we've done those comparisons. Okay, thanks. Yeah, uh, thanks for the question. Move on um, and leave other questions at the end. Yeah, let me, um, let me skip a little bit because we're running out of time and I'll go through, um, I'll just say um, one or two words about learning the learning dynamic behavior safely. Um, the, um, uh, yeah, so, so I'll say one word about this without actually showing the experiments. But we asked if, um, if once you've computed a reachable set for a nominal model of your system, can you then um, operate within that safe region computed for a nominal model and learn more about the dynamics of the system? So maybe there's some component of the system, for example, let me skip ahead, we'll skip this experiment. We'll skip this experiment. So for example, this was an experiment we did a couple of years ago um, with uh, Kene Akamatalu and Jaime Fizak, where we um, were asking the trajectory to follow you know, a step up and down in a room and the reachable set is computed. So it stays, you know, as it's approaching the ceiling, it stays away from the ceiling. As it's approaching the floor, it doesn't you know, go into the floor. So the velocity is trimmed away. But we introduced a disturbance in the form of this big fan that the quadrotor didn't know about. And so the ghosted out quadrotor is still trying to operate within that reachable set for the nominal model, while the, the non-ghosted out quadrotor has updated the reachable set based on the, um, the level set function. So the, the value of the level set, <coughs> which, um, <clears throat> excuse me, which corresponds to the, the worst case disturbance that it's measuring in real time. <coughs> yeah, excuse me about that. So it's, um, it's updating that reachable set in real time based on the disturbance function that it's measuring in real time. And it's using that pre-computed level set function and just moving from one level set to the other. So it, there's no computation needed to do that real-time update of the reachable set. Um, to conclude, the work that we're doing now is really coming to the point that I mentioned at the beginning, where we'd like to um, we'd like to have a perception module in a feedback control loop that is um, you know, in real time perceiving the environment and um, you know, learning about how it should maneuver in that environment, so an unstructured environment, um, when it say only knows about like where it is and where its goal is. And this is joint work done with uh, Saurabh Gupta who is there now when he was um, a PhD student in Jitendra Malik's group. So, you know, specialists in computer vision um, working with us on designing perception modules that will fit into a control loop. And I think I'll end by um, showing the architecture that we, we've been using and developing where we think of a modular architecture with a perception module. This is a convolutional neural net. It's taking images that are captured in real time from our robot. And then 
it outputs a waypoint. So a waypoint in uh, as a next point to get to in a path towards its known goal. So we assume we know its goal position and you know its current measurements. We assume we have some inertial measurements of those. Um, and, and we go through standard planning. So this is just a spline-based planner and standard control. This is a, um, we used a, a linear quadratic regulator here over a time horizon here that we choose. So the, the questions that we're interested in now, and I think that you know, having a great set of meetings today with several um, uh, friends at, at UIUC and finding a lot of commonality in the challenge problems we're working on, but how does one understand now how to prove the safety? Because this is now your learning component is no longer like a disturbance in your dynamics. It's a whole module in itself, which is providing, you know, basically a, you know, information as to what to do next based on real-time information that it's perceiving. So how do we even think about like pr proving safety or certifying control loops that have these deep neural networks used, um, used you know, ubiquitously in computer vision, but now we're putting that in a control loop, which is a safety critical control loop. So those are the kinds of questions we're working on now. We've been using reachability as a kind of uh, filter to again, um, you know, suppose you had a separate channel in which you had a sensor that allowed depth information, you could compute a nominal safe set boundary and then use the perception module to update those. So I'd like to um, conclude, I'm gonna go to my um, concluding slide to say that um, we've been working on safety problems from reachability analysis. Um, and in the recent years, we've been focusing on how we will learn from new information. So how do we, you know, even questions of as we're getting new data and we're in a safety critical scenario, how do we update these kind of, these bookkeeping methods that we have reachability to be able to take that new data into account and provide safe control. Um, we're, we're, we're focusing now particularly on unstructured environments, meaning we don't know what's around us. We may have some, you know, model of what it's going to be, but, but how, but really we don't know what the environment is and we're perceiving it in real time. So um, our approach so far has been to supervise learning using optimal control. Um, but how do we, you know, how do we incorporate, for example, unstructured environments or predictive models, for example, predictive models of humans how do we achieve high confidence in this? And these are, these are some of the questions we're focusing on. So I'd like to conclude the talk by thanking, um, well, let me just say that one of the problems we're working on is you know, people moving around and how do we avoid you know, people using these predictive models and this neural network-based architecture. So I'd like to conclude by thanking um, a large number of people that, uh, that worked on this research with us. Um, the, the folks in bold are students in my group and um, uh, other folks have graduated and gone to different places. And I'd like to thank our um, funding agencies who've um, funded this work and, and worked on um, in collaboration. Um, in particular, Alexandra Faust at Google, and we've also collaborated quite closely with uh, Jitendra Malik's group um, in particular, Saurabh, who's at the talk. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Claire, for a wonderful talk. Uh, um, uh, if you don't mind, we can uh, definitely uh, get some questions. Um, you can either speak up or put in the chat and uh, we can then read through the questions. Um, <clears throat> I do have a question. So in your work with Professor Dragon's lab, um, the objective functions were known, right? You knew where the humans wanted to go because they were going to preset locations and you could create an, uh, an objective function based on the distance from that point, for instance. Uh, have, have you investigated what happens when, you have un, when you're trying to estimate uh, the objective function, either by first inverse reinforcement learning or by trying to identify the human's predict, you know, the human's uh, intention, like intent prediction. Like how does the, 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 the safety boundaries you've, you've drawn work in that, situ in that situation where you have like accumulating uncertainties? 
we, we, I think that's a very interesting question. And we've so far in the work we've done together, we've been assuming either one goal or a set of goals that are pre-specified that we have a library of those. And, um, and then we can work with those goals in, the, in that value function queue. We have done an adaptive version. So we've been working recently on adaptive version of that where you don't really wanna maintain all those goals. So, so could you maintain an active subset of those goals and then have a procedure for, you know, if it looks like what the person is doing is outside of that active subset, a method for, you know, augmenting that with the most likely goals. Um, and then maybe after a while, if, you know, there's a goal that's just not visited, kind of removing that from the active subset. So that, that's, that's something we've been working on. I think there's a lot of interesting questions in, you know, first of all, like sort of discovering that set of goals, but so far we've been assuming we have that set. I see, thank you. You're welcome. All right, any other uh, questions? Yeah, uh, I have one. Go ahead, Narendra. So uh, suppose that we had a scenario where planning a path, not a given trajectory, but you want to go from A to B, and the space is not exactly, you know, um, space is tight, and you almost have to control your shape. You can control your shape, so you're, you have an active control button. And so you kind of negotiate your shape through the obstacle. You can make it, but you cannot make it with a static shape, like going through the revolving door with two chairs in hands, two hands. Yeah. How do you, I mean, how do you kind of extend this to, you can always say that you will dynamically create the reachability set or safety constraints, but then you also have to strategize. You have to decide how do I change my shape so that I can avoid the obstacle. Yeah, that's a great question. And I think there's a different ways to do it. And the way we did that, because we did work on that actively was, um, we, we proposed a, a method where we have a variety of, um, we have a, like a, a high dimensional tracking model, but then we have a variety of planning models. Maybe there's a very simple point mass. That's our simplest model, fastest model. Then we can, um, we can uh, have a, maybe a little more complex, maybe just a kinematic model describing that, um, you know, that shape and the motion. Um, maybe a, an even more, maybe a simple dynamic model. So maybe, you know, one tracking model with three planning models. So this represents an example that we've worked on. And then we can pre-compute the, the using fast track that tracking error bound with respect to the three different couplings of planning one with tracking, planning two with tracking, planning three with tracking. Now, the, the, then when you're applying that in real time, you have these three different or N different sets that you can switch between. So, so the problem becomes one of meta planning. How do you then um, anticipate, you know, you're gonna get to a, a doorway or a narrow corridor and, you know, out in wide space, wide open space, you, there's no reason why you shouldn't just use the simplest planning model possible, just plan fast. Then you, um, then you sense, uh, you, you have to have a sensing bound which allows that, but you sense that coming up is a narrow corridor or a doorway. Um, you can actually then um, compute using reachability at what point you have to switch to a more complicated planning model. That's gonna slow you down because planning is slower with higher dimensional models. But that's kind of intuitive, right? When you're, when you're walking down a corridor, you might slow down, you might plan a little more deliberately. Um, because you're using a more detailed model. But the reachable set computation, you know, that allows you to compute exactly when you have to switch so that you can guarantee that the tracking error bound computed with your, um, uh, with your slower planner is, uh, you know, you have time to get into that, that smaller tracking error bound around the planning model and then, um, and then proceed with the plan. So we, um, we, 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 after publishing the fast track paper, we started working on this meta planning paper using fast track. And we've also, we've published that. It's not a precise answer to your question, Narendra, um, because it's not, 
it's sort of, it's got this discrete switching between tracking error bounds, but it's approaching the idea that I think you're bringing up, which is you, you're, you're going to go through modes of, um, you know, pr probably very, you, know, you don't need to be accurate with modes where you're going to want to do more deliberate planning in a, an area where you need to be more accurate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. All right. Uh, uh, okay, there was... So I have another quick question that I wanted to run by. Oh, so, so, oh sort of, we have one more question. Oh, sorry, okay. Um, in the chat. Um, so if you don't mind, I will read the, the chat. Go for it, yes, sorry, I, I'll so go after. I yeah. wonder, uh, in the deep reach work, how do you get the ground truth in the loss function for training since you don't have infinite time estimates of the value function anymore? It's a question yeah. from Simon. That's a really good question. So, you know, if you were using this deep reach in a supervised setting, you'd need some way to get your value function, right? But we don't have that. So instead we use this self-supervised mode. We're using the Hamilton Jacobi PDE as a source of supervision. So you consider that loss function, uh, the one that incorporates the Hamilton Jacobi function for a truly optimal theta, we want that loss to be zero. So we use that law, we use that like the, you know, the Hamilton Jacobi function with the, the uh, initial data as the loss function. So it's like a self-supervised method because you don't know what that optimal value function is. That's what, you don't have an oracle to give you that. So you use a self-supervised method, but what you do know is the equation that you're trying to solve, right? So you're taking advantage that you're solving a scientific problem where you know the equation and you know the initial data and use that as your, as your loss function for self-supervision. Thank you. Sora, you have- Yeah, uh, so I, I guess my question was uh, back to this uh, slide where you were, you had these uh, neural networks that were outputting things and if you can guarantee something over there. Now, my, my basic question was that with these neural networks, there are these annoying uh, adversarial examples where, where, I mean, people have these cases on ImageNet, for example, that you feed in an image, you perturb it a little bit, and then you get a different output on the other side. So I'm wondering what are the kind of tools that you are thinking about when you are trying to character, uh, characterize safe learning in context of these models? Yeah, so that's a really good question. And I don't, I don't have a good answer. So what we did in the safety analysis of this so far, or is, so what you're asking is, how do you, in your perception module here, how do you make sure that you're not, um, you know, getting some, there's not some sort of strange situation where you put in an image and then you get something really wrong that's going to mess up your whole control loop. So we haven't actually, so, so we've got work going on there, but what I, sh what I've, I showed is, is sort of a different tack that you've got some separate channel, which is giving you, you know, a rough map of obstacles, then you can use reachability to compute a safety verifier. So if your perception module gives you a waypoint that's going to push you into the boundary, then it's that 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 Hamilton Jacobi control is just going to push you away. Okay, so that's different from, you know, having a kind of purely independent perception module that's based on this convolutional neural network. And then you want to take that output and feed that through the control loop without any other sensor that you're using. So we've got um, a couple of different projects going on here. One is um, to try to test, first of all, if if you had a distribution of the training data that you used to train the perception module, you could test um, a particular, like a single image, you could test it for typicality to that distribution to ask how is it related to the distribution itself and perhaps design a monitor based on that to say, aha, you know, this data that we're getting, but, but that doesn't actually answer your question, which is you have an image and then, you know, there's just, it's, it's, it's there's just some small change that is not captured by your, you know, that like that that's hard to detect whether that image is in distribution or not. And I think these are, you know, these are really good questions. We have to somehow have a robust way of characterizing the uncertainty in the output. So this is it's maybe not appropriate just to have a waypoint, but to have a 
a region of waypoints or a region that would be, you know, this should be like the, the, the in general, a waypoint in this region all has equal cost. But still, I think this is one of the big challenges here is how do we how do we validate this behavior in a high dimensional neural network where you know reachability tools applied to the neural network are not going to work because it's it they just don't scale to that mm -hmm. high a dimension. I think there may be an answer here, which is that <clears throat> these uh, these anomalies will occur for occasional images, but the point is that here there is a situation where there is a sequence of images and it's unlikely that successive images would be all bad. And so it's possible to ignore or, or smooth out over these anomalies by you know, using the previous and the following frames. I think that's, that's a really great suggestion is that usually we're operating in a real time environment where we're getting these images as a sequence. Um, and so I agree. We, we have a project um, that's called Assured Autonomy. It's a DARPA funded project, which is asking exactly this problem. How do you assure um, safety properties of perception modules in a, in a, like a neural net, net based perception module in a closed loop um, system like this? And our partner in this project is Boeing. So Boeing is equipping one of their test aircraft with cameras and we've done this project now for two years. This year, they're doing landings. So they're landing this uh, aircraft um, and the, the, the camera feeds are feeding perception modules that are asking, you know, is there, is there something on the runway that's gonna cause you to want to do a takeoff go around? Um, but it's, you know, we, we've got, you know, different analysis tools that, but, but you know, it's, we're not there yet in terms of proving safety. Thank you, thanks. All right, well, I think uh, uh, there are no more questions. Uh, I would like to close the RT Chen lecture. Thank you so much, Claire, for coming and giving this uh, uh, very interesting lecture. And uh, we hope to host you, uh, hopefully in the near future, in person in CSL. And uh, uh, please uh, stay safe. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Thank you, Clara, Bye. and thanks, everyone.